So the next chapter is called The Age of Lions. The, the reason why is it starts, so this is, uh, it discusses the sort of period right before the second urban phase. The second urban phase occurs in the Gangetic Plain. And it's called, this chapter is called The Age of Lions because you start to see the appearance, the appearance of the, you start to see the appearance of the Asiatic lion in South Asia. So what Sanya sort of suggests in his book is that the drying up of the Saraswati River might have caused the whole area to lose moisture. So this area in the Indus Valley that used to be jungle started to become more of like plains. So what that allowed was for the, for the Central Asian Asiatic lion to start to migrate down into India. See, that area used to be inhabited by tigers, primarily. It still is. But then you start to see lions enter the area, and then you start to see them making their way into the iconography of the peoples in a similar way to the way, to the way they're used in Persia, which is as symbols of royalty or strength. Most notably, you see the lion appearing in the Mauryan imagery, which is still used by the government of India today. Now, this is an in another interesting part Another interesting aspect of this period is you start to see this is a period that sort of where it's very likely that the Mahabharata and the Ramayana were composed. So this is like post 600 BC. The way that Sanyal talks about the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, he's not looking for, you know, historical information. He's looking at how geographical knowledge has expanded. So he points out that the Mahabharata, generally speaking, is oriented along an east-west axis, whereas the Ramayana is oriented along a north-south axis. Now what's interesting is that this corresponds very roughly to the axes along which the Uttarapat and the Dakshinapat are oriented. They're trade routes that are ancient trade routes that have been now, NH1 is along this route, National Highway 1 going towards Amritsar is along this route. The other one, the Dakshina part, part uh, runs from Allahabad down to the very deep south. So we know that because Allahabad and Ayodhya are sort of a huge point in the Ramayana, and then the battle with Ra Ravan takes place in Sri Lanka, which is all the way down south. Now what's interesting is also that it, it shows how the relationship between different regions has evolved. Because if you look at Ravana, Ravana is, is interesting because Ravan is living in Lanka. He's living very far away from the Gangetic Plain. But the way that he is presented, he's presented as an insider. He's presented as somebody who is following a very similar culture to that of the Gangetic Plain. So you see how like the relationship between different regions has evolved. Where these areas that would have been very far apart are sort of growing closer together. So during this period after the this the sort of like 500 BC onwards period, you see the emergence of early historic cities like Varanasi, you see um <clears throat> Mathura, all of these major cities in the Gangetic Plain start to emerge during this time period. Varanasi was likely a sort of apex along this trade route. So you start to see, through trade, ideas start to come together. And it still plays this very important role in our culture today. During this time period, you also see Sanskrit being standardized by Panini, and Ayurveda become systematized. You also see Alexander coming in from Europe and starting to make his way into India only to get stopped before he made it all the way in. Now in the book, Sanya kind of gives a more in-depth story, but here I'll, we'll just mention that his story was mentioned in the book. And after Alexander, you see Chandragupta Maurya with his mentor Chanakya, uh, who by the way wrote the Artha Shastra, um, sort of start to become uh, sort of become his name starts to become bigger chandragupta maurya starts to gain prominence and starts to create his own kingdom 
in the next chapter, the age of merchants, you, th this is a period t sort of uh, after the Mauryan Empire collapses. So um, basically the collapse of the Mauryan Empire really happened after Ashoka. So after Chandragupta became sort of m more prominent, he started expanding his empire. Chandragupta started expanding his empire. Then after that, his son, he went off and became a Jain monk. He went off and started fasting until he died. So, uh, after his son Bindusara, Ashoka came in and expanded this empire all the way down to basically the area that is now part of Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So, of course, Ashoka is famous for converting to Buddhism, as they say, after the conquest of Kalinga. So after he fell apart, after, after he died, his empire collapsed. Ashoka's empire collapsed and became a bunch of small kingdoms. Now during this time period also, a famine in what is now Mongolia created a chain reaction of migrations that ended up bringing an Asiatic people down into what is now India. And they created an empire known as the Kusharnas. Now the Kusharnas... Now, this is going to be some a part where I depart from the book. If you ever see Kusharna architecture, you'll notice it, it, it expands all the way up until Bihar. From Afghanistan to Bihar, that's how big their empire was. So, this empire was a very... Uh, he, he doesn't spend a whole lot of time on this empire, but it, it is a very significant period. This is also the time period in the south where you see Sangam literature start to expand. And that's extremely important for South Asian, for South Indian history. During this, but this chapter is called the Age of Merchants because during this period you see Europeans and Middle Eastern, uh, you start to see European and Middle Eastern merchants coming to the Indian subcontinent to do trade. Sanyal estimates that the that India accounted for 33% of the world's GDP during this time period. Now, of course, there's like, it's really difficult to convert their economics to ours, but this kind of shows you how significant India was during the second century AD. You start to also see the emergence of Indianized kingdoms in Southeast Asia during the second century AD, you start to see Indianized kingdoms in Southeast Asia, which, which sort of set the stage for later kingdoms like Angkor. And during this period, you also see Indian culture start to disseminate through the trade routes. So during this later part of the Age of Merchants, you start to see the second large Indian empire emerge, the Guptas. And the Guptas were almost like the successors to the Mauryas. So this, the Guptas started with Chandragupta I. And then they started to expand, mostly under Samudra Gupta, who declared himself then the Chakravartin. Chakravartin means he whose chariots can go anywhere, which basically means that he's sort of the ruler of the world. So the Guptas invested heavily in intellectual endeavors. You see Aryabhata uh, estimate the circumference of the world. The emperor Kamudra Gupta founded Nalanda, which is a university. So, uh, of sorts, it's, uh, it became um, a huge hub for Buddhist studies. And then the Vakatakas saw the, oversaw the construction. The Vakatakas were a Maharashtrian uh, kingdom that were contemporaneous with the Guptas, and they oversaw the construction of the Alora and the Ajanta Caves. So basically, the Guptas' decline after this period saw the sort of collapse of Pataliputra, which was the capital of the Mauryan Empire.